let's take a moment now to pray and immediately after I've prayed um, Louise is going to uh, read to us on video from Jonah first of all uh, let me pray Heavenly Father we thank you this morning that uh, we are within the sound of the Christian message and in our nation and in our part of the world it isn't difficult uh, to hear the Christian message somewhere. Um, we thank you Lord for all that's available on digital media as well as all that's available live. And we are grateful that we ourselves have opportunity uh, regularly to hear the Christian message. But we've also heard mention in that video Lord of nations where the gospel is in decline. And it may be that that is the case in the UK just now. We're very aware that there is a certain hostility in many places towards you and your message. Some of it coming from the media, some of it coming from maybe higher up in authorities of various kinds. We've seen a number of your people um, prosecuted often, as it turns out in the end, wrongly, uh, for preaching in the street. Uh, we've seen people dismissed from their jobs for expressing uh, Christian views, things that would simply not have happened 10 years ago, 15 years ago. We are in, in many ways a sad place in our own nation. And Lord, we do pray that the fact that, that if we get back to normal, it may be that our building will fill up again. Help us not to think that that means all is well in our country. Uh, we do lift our nation before you, and as always, the, the rulers of our nation uh, that you would make them seek righteousness and make them realize the effects of uh, the decisions that they make and the consequences that will follow. We pray as always for the nations of the world and their leaders and we ask Heavenly Father that you will be gracious to our world. You have mercy upon it. We sometimes wonder if you haven't left our world to its own devices because it's turned away from you. Please have mercy on the world in which we live. And as we think of those unreached people groups and, and the, the apparent disparity between where the need is and where the workers tend to go, we ask that you would help us as a church do a little something at least to address that issue in whatever way is appropriate for us as a fellowship with our gifts, with who we have amongst us. Please help us to play our part, all of us, uh, in reaching those who have not yet heard your word. We ask that you will challenge us and help us to do all that we can to advance the cause of the kingdom of God. We thank you for one another and we do thank you once again for the opportunity of being able to gather here this morning, uh, whether in the building or online. Lord, you know our joys and sorrows. You know how many of us come with a, a sense of ease and a certain contentment. Things are well in our particular world. We're not looking forward to anything as far as we know that's a threat. But others of us are not in that position. There are issues in our lives, maybe to do with our work, maybe to do with our health, maybe to do with our families. There are issues that trouble us and concern us. And we have struggled to put them to one side this morning in order to concentrate. Please help us, and as we study your word in a moment, we pray that a very ancient text might speak with remarkable um, power to us today. So please help us. We can only come as we are, fallen human people, sinful people, but we come to the God who has sent the Lord Jesus Christ into the world uh, to bring people peace and to bring them security. And we ask Heavenly Father that we may be greatly comforted and encouraged to meet here this morning. So please be with us now, we pray, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. reading this morning is from the book of Jonah. If you have a church Bible, that's on page 928. And it's Jonah chapter 1 verses 1 to 17. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish, he went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for the port. 
After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, tell us who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them and they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher so they asked him, what should we do to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it's my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they couldn't, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, please Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do pray that you will speak until your church is built, all of it, and the world is filled with your glory. Amen. A certain digital encyclopedia with which you may be familiar informs anyone who wishes to check that there is a small set of ruins on a hilltop near the Arab village of El Meshed, five kilometers north of Nazareth and one kilometer from the place that used to be known as Cana in Galilee. And this set of ruins was previously the hometown of a man called Jonah and it was known in his day as Gath Hefer and here some 2,800 years later what is said to be the tomb of Jonah is still pointed out today by the locals. Now today we're beginning a series of four studies in the Old Testament book of Jonah um, in doing so we're going back some 2,800 years and about 780 years before the time of Christ which does raise the question as to why a group of sane adults in the 21st century should want to spend half an hour or so studying a very ancient text um, but I hope the reasons for that will become clear now we don't know much about uh, Jonah the man um, he's described in 2 Kings, chapter 14, verse 25, as a prophet from Gav Hefer. And in Old Testament times, a prophet was someone who received messages directly from the Lord God and was therefore literally God's spokesperson. And we find Jonah in this role, or at least we find him eventually in this role, in the book that bears his name. Now, Jonah's mission involved him going some 600 miles, you see the red line there, 600 miles 
to the east. That was what uh, he was supposed to be doing, and he had a specific message uh, to send to, to Nineveh. If you happen to know where Mosul is today, then it's roughly that area. If you don't, you will now go home and look that up, I'm sure. And although the book's entitled Jonah, and it's obviously about Jonah, he's not ultimately the most important figure in the book. Um, true, he's the only major figure in the book, if you don't count the fish. Um, but the really significant actor um, is, of course, the Lord. And you note the capital letters in your English versions a number of times when the Lord is referred to, capital letters indicating the personal name uh, of God. And he's our creator, and nothing is more important than those whom God has created should know the one who has created them. And the book of Jonah will help us to do exactly that. Now those who've read the book of Jonah before us um, have noted there are different ways of summarizing it. You can easily divide the book in half, and you can see that each half has the same structure. So were you to take a quick skim across the four chapters, you'd find that chapters 1 and 2 are about the Lord's word to Jonah, Jonah's response to the Lord, and the consequences that follow. And if you look at chapters 3 and 4, you will find that they're about the Lord's word to Jonah, Jonah's response to the Lord, and the consequences that follow. If then you examine each, of, each half of the book in more detail, you can find a pattern that is absolutely repeated in the second half, the same as the first. Some of you may have come across Tim Keller's book, The Prodigal Prophet. It's about Jonah, uh, and he goes into a little detail about the various ways you can divide the text up. Now, for our purposes, what we're going to do this morning is simply to notice um, four characteristics, four things that the book tells us about the Lord, which emerge in the first chapter and also are found elsewhere in the book. So, what we're going to see this morning is that the Lord speaks, the Lord sends, the Lord knows, and the Lord cares. That's where we're going uh, this morning. So, first up, the Lord speaks. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. And first of all, you're, you're meeting the God who speaks. Now, Jonah was a prophet, and as I've said, in Old Testament times, the Lord would usually speak directly th to a prophet, giving them a message either for Israel or sometimes for the nations uh, around about, for the wider world. Now, the writer of the New Testament book of Hebrews says in chapter 1 and verses 1 to 3, in surveying God's ways of communication in the Christ in, before the Christian era, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom also he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. In these last days, God has spoken to us by his Son. Now, the role of the prophets in the Old Testament was historically limited and unique in the past. And you will notice the writer makes the point that in these last days, which are the days that we're in, the Christian era, he's spoken to us by his Son. So when we come across an example in the Bible of how God used to speak to people, in the times before the coming of Jesus Christ, that should lead us to ask whether God has spoken to us by means of his Son. The Bible shows us time and time again that God is the Lord and the God who speaks. By the way, try never to speak about God and say that he is a God who speaks. How many are there? There is one. He is the God, the Lord, who speaks. Okay? And this morning, can we say that he's spoken to us through his Son? Can I say that for myself? Can you say that for yourself this morning? So the first thing, the Lord speaks. The second thing, the Lord sends. The word of the Lord is is quite specific to Jonah. He is being given a mission. He's to go to Nineveh and preach a particular message against the city. And how in, indeed, uh, well how and whether for that matter, 
<laughs> the mission is carried out provides the plot line, if you like, for the book. Now, Nineveh was the capital of Assyria, and as we've already seen, it's located 600 miles to the northeast of Jonah's hometown of Gath Hefer in Israel. Now, Assyria was a kind of world power in those days, and it was well known and it was feared for the cruelty with which it oppressed the peoples that it conquered. Uh, if you really want to, you can research uh, Assyrian cruelty and what they did uh, to their captors. Do not worry, I'm not going to give you any of the details. You can manage quite comfortably uh, without them. But, but the, 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 they could terrorize people and, and uh, many of their actions and activities were horrific. So for Jonah, this was not potentially going to be a walk in the park, exactly. Remember that he was instructed to preach against it, against the city. Now, as you may know, the words apostle used to describe in the first instance the 12 followers of the Lord Jesus Christ who particularly assisted him during his mission um, in his lifetime. And the word missionary usually used to describe a Christian who is commissioned by their local church and sent to engage in evangelism in a particular place. Both those words, apostle and missionary, come from uh, words that mean uh, in Greek and Latin uh, Greek for apostle and Latin for missionary, they come from words that mean to send. And it's sometimes said of the Lord God, and again we must remember not to use the word a, but to use the word the, he is the missionary God. He sends people. And what we see here is part of a normal pattern whereby the Lord sends one person to speak on his behalf to others. And in Old Testament times, prophets spoke to the, Lord, the Lord's people on behalf of God himself, as I said earlier, sometimes to the surrounding nations. And in these last days, in the Christian era, the Lord sends people who have become disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ to go and make other disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, i.e. the Lord sends people to speak to people on his behalf. And Jonah being sent by the Lord to speak to people, to other people, should surely put one or two thoughts in our own minds again. Are you aware in your life of the Lord having graciously sent someone to bring his message to you? Is there someone, maybe several people, at different times perhaps, whom you can identify as having been instrumental in how you became a Christian. Uh, I'm not going to anticipate what we will find in Jonah 2, 3 and 4, though some of you will know the story, but there would, let's just say there would be people in Nineveh who would have reason to remember Jonah. Now, did the Lord perhaps place you in a Christian family? Your parents were Christians. Was that, as it were, how he sent his word to you through them? Did the Lord send along a youth leader, a teacher at school, someone at college, a pastor, an evangelist, a missionary into your life? If so, uh, don't forget to thank the Lord for them. Do, do you know where they are? Are they with the Lord now? Uh, are they still around somewhere? Do you ever have contact with them? The Lord will have sent someone, or maybe a group of people, into your life. Uh, I believe the man who the Lord sent into my life has been dead for many years, but I am grateful to him, uh, Ken his name was, who spoke on the night that I became a Christian. If we have come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, think of this slightly differently, what part can we play in the transmission of the Christian message to others? How can we be the person whom the Lord might send? Now, the Lord does not send all his people specifically to be missionaries, pastors, Christian workers. I was going to say, don't worry, but <laughs> I'm not going to say that, um, because this might be you we're talking about. But what he does do, and this is sometimes how you find out what else he might have for you to do, he gives all of us gifts that we can use in his service. And the most important thing is to identify the gifts he's given you and seek to use them usually in your own local fellowship. And then if the Lord would have you do something else or go somewhere else, um, he will make that plain. 
I know that. Um, he makes it plain. So the issue is not, oh, I, you know, I, I wouldn't want to be a missionary, I wouldn't want to be a pastor. Don't think, don't think that way, it's not the way to think. Simply think, Lord, what gifts have you given me? The Lord will not, if you're a round, if you're a square peg, sorry, if you're a square peg, he won't put you in a round hole. Does that make sense? You know what I mean? He won't, he won't put you in a place where your gifts don't fit. That's not how he works. He puts people in the places where their gifts fit. So, something to think about as you think about the fact the Lord sent Jonah to people. But what if we have no experience of the Lord having spoken to us or sent someone to us with his word? What if we're thinking this doesn't, doesn't resonate uh, with, with me at all? Well, could it be that's why this morning you're here with us or online studying the book of Jonah? Because this is going to be the Lord's way of speaking to you. Keep listening, keep looking. The Lord God still speaks and the Lord God still sends. And you'll also notice in chapter 1 that he sends not only Jonah to Nineveh but also a storm and also the calm that ends the storm and also the great fish. You see, God sends all kinds of things apart from people. It's one way of looking at what happens in your life. Tricky sometimes, but God can send events, situations, circumstances, as well as people. So the Lord speaks and the Lord sends. And the next thing we see is that the Lord knows. Now, why does the Lord instruct Jonah to go to Nineveh? Well, we've already touched on the answer. There it is in chapter 1 and verse 2. He's to preach against it because, the Lord says, its wickedness has come up before me. So, that tells us that he knew about Nineveh. The Lord knows about the people in Nineveh. They're 600 miles away from Israel. But it, its wickedness has come up in his sight. And his patience with them is nearly at an end. I say nearly. In chapter 1, we're not given any detail about this. We do have to stray a little bit into the other chapters. And in chapter 3, we're given a little bit more information from which we learn that Nineveh has actually been given 40 days. Verse 4 of chapter 2. 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. And what that's telling us, therefore, is that they have a 40-day window to repent or it's too late. That's what you're being told. Now Jonah couldn't possibly have been surprised that the Lord knew about Nineveh. He himself describes the Lord in verse 9 of chapter 1 as the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. In other words, the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. Of course the Lord knew about Nineveh, just as he knew about all the nations of the world. And nothing has changed. The Lord God knows and notes the behaviour of every nation. Every nation. And of every person in it, from the greatest to the least. And as he is our creator, he has the sovereign right to make judgments and assessments about people and cultures and nations. And if he decides that a nation may have reached the point of no return, or nearly reached the point of no return, that's his right. Where do you think our nation is? How far is it to a point of no return if the Lord were not merciful? Now the fact that the Lord knows can be an encouragement to our faith. As you look around the world today and as far as, anyway, as you can with whatever the, the media gives you to look at, you can become disheartened, can't you? And in some places it seems that individuals, communities, nations are getting away with murder, literally. And a study of history, including, of course, the Bible, tells us this has often been the case. We ask, where is the Lord? You must have asked that. You're a Christian believer, and you look at the news media, however you do it, and there's some horrendous thing. It, it, may, it may not be a, a, a crime as such. It, it, it may simply be a tragedy of a building collapsing and people dying in it. 
But whatever it is, you think, does the Lord know? And of course, if you think that about events in the world, you, you think it even more when it happens to you, don't you? Does the Lord know? Well, he always does. There is nothing he doesn't know. No aspect of human behaviour, good or bad, escapes his attention. And there's a day of reckoning coming, not on the small scale of what might happen to Nineveh, but the Lord's day, the last day, the great day, when everybody will have to give an account of how they have lived, and injustice will be put right for eternity. Of course, it's also a challenge, as well as an encouragement, it's a challenge to, to, how, uh, to us, because if the Lord knows about Nineveh, and he knows about the nations of the earth. He knows about us, doesn't he? He knows about each of us. He knows who we are and how we live. We also see that he knew about Jonah. Um, for reasons that we will come to briefly in a moment, Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed to Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. Now there's some difference uh, of opinion. Uh, after paying the fare, he went, down, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the presence of the Lord. Repeat it twice, isn't it? Uh, some difference of opinion as to where Tarshish is. Um, oh, I've got the maps in the wrong place. Never mind. Um, let me just see what happens here. All oh, right, here we go. Um, here's a map, and that's where Jonah should have gone. All right, and that's where he went. All right. People reckon Tarshish is somewhere around the Straits of Gibraltar, give or take. Uh, it might be Tangier. It might be Cadiz. It could be somewhere. There. But it's it's it's. You see from Israel, sorry those of you watching me on camera, well, you, know, you can see this, can't you, on the screen, what am I talking about? Um, the point is that for, for Israel at this time, Tarshish represented kind of the edge of the world, you see, G going, going west. It was the edge of the world, there was nothing kind of beyond there. Uh, America, of course, hadn't been invented in, in those days. Um, uh, so you, you see what's going on. Um, can I just come back because I've got my own things out of sequence but never mind that's my fault uh, I must retire one of these days um, okay um, so the Lord knew about Jonah did he really think he could run away <laughs> here's David in Psalm 139 where can I go from your spirit where can I flee from your presence if I go up to the heavens you're there if I make my bed in the depths you're there if I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. What was he doing? He honestly imagined that once he got in that boat uh, and, and paid the fare and sat down in the passenger lounge, that, that um, it, was, it was all okay. It was all going to be all right. Now it's likely that many of us have to a greater or lesser extent had times when we have run away from the Lord. Not perhaps 2,400 miles or whatever it was. Not that he got there of course. Um, but you know what it is to run away sometimes from the Lord. Something you don't want to do. Situation you don't want to face. Um, well let's remember as we look at Jonah you know the expression, you can run, but you can't hide. And if there's anybody here or, or watching online, and actually unknown to us because these things are in the heart very often, they're not always physical, you're running away. That's what you're doing, you're running away. You may be even hiding in plain sight by being present in a Christian meeting. You can still be running away, present in a Christian meeting, you know. If you're running away, give it up. Just stop. I can't promise you that the Lord will send a great storm or a great fish, but I wouldn't fancy either of those, would you? Don't run. You cannot run from the Lord. Adam and Eve tried it. And he knew where they were. Don't run. It's always safer to come back. The Lord speaks, the Lord sends, the Lord knows, and as we've already seen, the Lord cares. Now the Lord cared for Nineveh. We've seen part of the answer to why the Lord sent Jonah to Nineveh, but we must just see something else. We, we must jump into chapter... 
Jump into chapter 4 if you do that. We, we don't want to take away from uh, those who are going to be preaching later, but we do have to jump into chapter 4 and, and the last verse. I'm not going to give you the context particularly, um, but this is the Lord speaking to Jonah about Nineveh. Should I not have con concern for the great city of Nineveh which, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and also many animals? Now, put that together with their wickedness has come up before me. You see how the Lord cares for Nineveh. He cares for Nineveh because their wickedness has come up before him and he wishes to be merciful to them. So Jonah has got to preach against Nineveh. There is an idea sometimes that the Christian gospel must always be positive. Not so. Not so. What does repent mean? Carry on the way you have been going? It means turn round, doesn't it? Go in a different direction. But you see, the, the negativity is because the Lord cares. So it's not total negativity. It's to awaken people to their need to turn to him. Because you see, the Lord looks at this horrendous nation with a horrendous record of torture and stuff they do to their prisoners and he says they don't know their right hand from their left. And both are true. And we have to share this, 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 this kind of balance, don't we? when we're, we're looking at the world around us. The wickedness comes up before the Lord. And at the very same time, they don't know their right hand from their left. Don't you know people who do terrible things and at the same time you think they really don't know what they're doing, do they? They just don't know. And you see the Lord cared for Nineveh. And it's because he cared for Nineveh so much that it did not matter what Jonah did or did not do, the Lord was going to send him to Nineveh. If he didn't want to go the easy way, he'd go the hard way. But because the Lord cared about Nineveh, he was going to grab Jonah and Jonah would eventually go to Nineveh via the belly of a great fish. Well, that's your fault, Jonah. You could have avoided that quite comfortably, but you chose not to. Your problem. Now, Jonah's problem with which we finish, and you're wondering, what about the rest of the chapter? Well, it's coming within these next two minutes. <laughs> All right. um, Jonah's problem was this. He was racially and theologically prejudiced. That was his problem. Look again at chapter 4 and verse 2. Jonah was arguing with the Lord. This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing from Tarshish. I knew that you're a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity, you see? I know what you're like. You forgive people. This is an evangelist talking. I know what you're like. You go and forgive people. And the problem is that Jonah is theologically prejudiced, he is racially prejudiced. When asked to produce his identity card in chapter 1, verses 7 to 9, what does he say? I'm a Hebrew. That's who I am. That's who I am. And as for his theological prejudice, well, he's very happy indeed for the Lord to be gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity, as long as he isn't like that to the Assyrians. You see, racial and theological prejudice. It's easy to see it. Do we share it? Do we share it? Do we have our racial and theological prejudices? Lord, we want you to build up our congregation. But we're not going to say this out loud, Lord, but we'd like only a certain type of person to come in. Some of us might be thinking a certain colour. Others of us might be thinking, no, I have no issue about the person's racial background. Uh, as long as sort of socially they, you know, they wash and they bring, they bring their children up well and they, they, do, they do the proper stuff. Very easy to have a prejudice, you know. We think you haven't got one. 
And most of us, because we've fallen human beings, have got a prejudice somewhere. Something to challenge us, isn't it? The Lord not only cared for Nineveh. Do you notice how he cared for those sailors? Who are the honourable people in chapter 1? They're the sailors. Who encourages Jonah to pray? The captain of the ship. Does it occur to you it should be the other way round? Right? When, when Paul is shipwrecked in the New Testament, he kind of takes charge in a certain sense of the spiritual care of the ship. Here, Jonah's asleep and the captain has to wake him up and say, why don't you pray? Because Jonah isn't. Why don't you call upon your God? Because Jonah isn't. They literally, they, they start off, by the way, not knowing anything about the Lord. Then they literally fear him when they realise that Jonah has disobeyed him. So they're more frightened than Jonah was. They end up praying specifically to the Lord in verse 14 when Jonah is in despair and he thinks it's all over with him and he thinks the best thing they can do is chuck him over the side. And interestingly, they, they accept the sacrifice. You could say, couldn't you, they put their trust in the sacrifice having honourably tried to find an alternative. They do everything to avoid doing what Jonah suggests. And it's almost as though, as Jonah, the reluctant evangelist, disappears over the side, people are being converted behind him. Don't think well, you've ever seen any of those kind of um, comedy movies. I don't usually watch them unless I really need my brain disengaged. But where, where the comedy is in what is going on behind as, as something is happening in the front, um, someone has just collapsed behind a desk or something has got poured over them, whatever. It's all going on in the background. Well, I always think of Jonah as while he is not doing what he's told, people are, people are turning to God in spite of him. You know? Um, and the Lord cared for these sailors. There is a debate about whether they were, you know, were they truly repented. Well, I think they were. I, I, don't, see, I don't see why. They called upon the Lord. Please, Lord, don't let us die in taking this man's life. Don't hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. Well, what the Lord, as far as they were concerned, Jonah was going to die, and that's the last they saw of him. But the Lord accepted this sacrifice. And, of course, if you know anything about the Christian message, that is going to remind you of a sacrifice to come. And I'll leave others in the series to draw attention to what the Lord Jesus Christ said about Jonah and the comparison between Jonah's three days uh, in the fish. Uh, and the Lord Jesus Christ. What a great sadness when unbelievers or God-fearers behave more honourably than the Lord's people. But what a great mercy that even the disobedience of his people may be used for the furtherance of his kingdom. You know, when I think back to the, how I was converted, you might think back to how you were, it never occurred to me, and I don't know if this is true, but it never occurred to me that any of the people involved might not have wanted to come, you know? Might not have wanted to be involved. And yet the Lord used them anyway. It's amazing, isn't it? Lastly, we really must finish. Uh, the Lord still cared for Jonah, didn't he? Still cared for Jonah. You're reading chapter 1, you think, why doesn't he give him up? Yeah, good idea. Check him over the side. Best suggestion you made all chapter 1, Jonah. But that's not the end, Jonah, is it? There's a great fish. More of which next time. How merciful and compassionate is the Lord. He speaks. He sends. He knows. He cares. And I trust it will be your experience that you know that he speaks to you. You're grateful for who he has sent into your life. And perhaps you'll be sent into other people's lives. You're grateful that he knows about the world and about you. And you're grateful that he cares for you. And that maybe your experience has been, if not literally the storm and the fish, that when you have wandered off, he has graciously brought you back. And he might even have done that this morning. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for your word and for the strange account of your servant Jonah, whom we do not condemn, for in reading about him, we see something of ourselves, perhaps. Deliver us from prejudice. Deliver us from disobedience. Please help us with the gifts you've given us to serve you 
for the furtherance of your kingdom. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.